Well, sir, I really appreciate you coming on the show with us today. I want to get right into this. Uh, that way we don't. Um, that way we maximize our time. Uh, you you had predicted uh, years ago uh, that the the country was ripe for a third party uh, candidate, um, and I wanted to ask you: Is the Donald Trump campaign and even Bernie Sanders to a lesser extent third party candidates running within the the two party system? You nailed it. That's exactly what's happened. Not so much with Bernie Sanders. He's more of a, you know, again, I'm a political atheist. I only, I only look at things through the way they are, not the way I want them to be. And I don't believe in either political party. Uh, you know, to me, the Republicans and Democrats, you know, they're no different than the Bloods and the Crips, except they have more blood on their hands and more money that, of ours that they've stolen in terms of all the wars they've started. On the, based on lies and slaughtering people around the world and robbing our dough in the name of too big to fail loan guarantees and tax breaks for their buddies. So I have nothing to do with, you know, the parties. And just a little background, Daniel, quickly. Out of graduate school many years ago, I used to run political campaigns in Westchester County in New York, just north of New York City. It's the richest county in America at the time. And I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. You know, I was so good at what I was doing, they were grooming me. And I designed and instructed American politics and campaign technology at St. John's University. So I, I know a bit of thing to do about uh -huh. running campaigns and what they're about. And Bernie Sanders, when you look at his record, He's really, you know, he, he goes off on some little tangents on the ends. But when it comes to war, and he says, I voted against the Iraq War. Uh, Bernie boy, uh, you're the guy that co-sponsored the Senate resolution for Gaddafi to stand down and for a no-fly zone. And Bernie, you were, you got protesters arrested when they protested against Bill Clinton's murderous war in Yugoslavia and isn't Kosovo lovely today as it's in revolution. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Bernie, you were right there with Afghanistan. And Bernie, you voted to fund every single war, even the one you voted against. So he's just a fraud. And on the other end, Trump is this guy, you know, that, that uh, you know, he was born on third base and thought he hit a home run. <laughs> his old man, you know, you know, really, his old man left him between two hundred to four hundred million dollars of family, and on this big, you know, real estate empire in New York City. I mean, everybody knows, you know, from this area, and he's just what he is. And you, Daniel, you get our Trends Journal, and if you go back to last April's issue, just about a year ago, the cover was "Liars, Cowards, Freaks, and Fools." Welcome to the presidential reality show. And that was before a reality champion like Trump got into the race. So all it is is a reality show. And he is that third party. Not so much mm. Sanders, but he is. Having said that, there is also room now for another party to fill the void. Because if it, as it looks as though if Hillary... In my campaign slogan, by the way, for 2016, mm -hmm. is Trump or Clinton, Hitler or Hitlery. <laughs> so if Hitlery wins, the Bernie disinfect disenfranchised are not going to go for her so much. And then you have a whole load of people that really don't like Trump at all for who he is, what he says, and how he does it. So there's another, there's room for another third party movement. And it's never been riper. And by the way, another way I made my name in my career is in my book, Trend Tracking. From the late 1980s, I predicted a new third party and mentioned something like Ross Perot. Hmm. Someone like Ross Perot would be the kind of candidate. So the conditions now are even greater. But yes, Trump is that third party candidate at some level. You know, Mr. Slente, whether it's the uh, Black Lives Matter or Trump, Sanders, or even the people in Nevada and Oregon that are protesting over government land, 
it, it appears that the natives here at home are pissed off. They've done some polling at Gallup. People are unhappy, distrusting of government. And I wanted to ask you, because you analyze so many different groups and demographics, do you, do you foresee, and, and maybe it's probably not going to happen in 2016, but is there anything out there that could bring these groups, bring this anger together to where it actually fights the oligarchs? You know, the, 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 what is that group, that Wall Street Occupy thing and Tea Party? Is there anything that could bring all this together to where it could actually be used for a force of good? Absolutely. It's never been, the conditions have never been better for it. For the reasons you said. And this has been building for a lot of years. And, uh, but, you know, we launched Occupy Peace last April here in Colonial Kingston, New York. We, we closed down the streets, the most historic four corners in America. The only place where there's a stone brill, building that predates the revolution on each corner. And we had Ralph Nader, Cindy Sheehan, uh, Dr. Robert Thurman, Uma Thurman's father, a renowned Buddhist, uh, Gary Null from New York City, very widely respected and followed. We put up our own money to make this happen. I've reached out to billionaires and multimillionaires, and we got the grand total of not one cent. And I know personally a few of them yeah and so what it's going to take and ralph nader and i spoke about this it's going to take multi-millionaires to help fund this to make it happen just as they help fund other things to make happen that bring negative consequences and if anyone thinks that money doesn't make the world go round you know just go back to the revolution i mean the founding fathers weren't paupers you know, they were very well to do a lot of them, plantation owners and on and on. So it's going to take money as much as um, a commitment. And that, the commitment, I think, I know can happen right away when people have another choice. But it's going to take real serious effort behind it to make it happen. You know, with uh, I love I love the theme war on peace, or excuse me, the uh, occupy peace. Uh, with that said. You know, we we do have um, militaries uh, and some of the some of the top militaries of the world kind of uh, pointed at each other right now with the South China Sea. You have Syria, Russia. Uh, in your latest trends report, you did give a, a stark warning about the potential of World War Three. Is this a, is this a real danger? And uh, where do you think it's most likely to start? It could start anywhere. And it could happen if there's another terrorist strike, false flag, or real in the United States. You know, people forget what happened in uh, 2001. You know, Bush, you know, was fraudulently you know, awarded the election. And again, you know, Gore or, or Bush would make no difference to me. It, it, both of them, are, you know, two human beings I wouldn't associate with. But the dot-com bubble had burst in March of 2000. People forget this. And what happened was we were in a recession. Bush comes into office, and it's uh, what? It's January, what? End of January comes into office 2001. So you have February, March, April, May, June, July, August, eight months later, 9 11. Bush's popularity ratings were going below 50% before 9 11. After 9 11, they shot up to the 90s which shows you you can fool most of the people most of the time. Hmm. And then what they did is Alan Greenspan came in and, and had the neg the um, lowered interest rates to 46-year lows. I mean, here we are as we're speaking, you know, the NASDAQ is around 4,500, right? Hmm. This is 16 years later. It was at 5,000 back then. So the whole thing was juiced in a phony way. It was all this cheap money, and it continues. Going back to where could the terrorist strike happen? If a terrorist strike happens on the United, in the United States, again, false flag or real, people's minds will be off the lousy economy in a split second. Hmm. And it's the same situation around the world. We're in a global recession. You look at the GDP numbers coming out of... Uh, Japan, they're in recession, negative. 
The ones that just came out of Europe, the grand total of what, like 1.5% 1, 1. growth? No growth. You look at the ones coming out of the United States. Look at China. Their, their GDP is the slowest growth since, what, a quarter of a century ago? You look at the economies. Oh, they just downgraded uh, uh, Brazil's bond rating to junk. Oh, the BRICS. Oh, yeah, remember the BRICS? They were going to build real big. Huh? Brazil, Russia, China, India, and, and, and South Africa. One lousy deal after another. This thing could explode anywhere. Because when all else fails, they take you to war. <laughs> and I have to tell you, Daniel, I am sick and tired of hearing the BS from the bankers and the bravado from the military. I've had it. I don't want to hear another retired general, general this, major that. I don't want to hear another one of their BS strategies on we have a plan. Everything they've done is turned to failure and disastrous consequences. With the, with according to Stiglitz and and the woman that they did this study, it's over seven trillion dollars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Some two million people killed, entire areas destroyed. Gee, I wonder why they hate us. I can't figure it out. She terrorists. Why would anybody want to blow our brains out after we've blown so many others out? Oh, how dare you say that, Mr. Salenti? We're exceptionals. We can kill who we want, and they have no right to ever think of retaliating. Right. I've had it with their baloney because these same sick SOBs are marching us into the next war. Look how they're expanding NATO to Russia's borders now. You talked about China. Pivot to Asia? Who made this stuff up? And you know what really gets me? And none of these guys, there's not a man among them. A bunch of little boys with cojones the size of mothballs if you put them all together. They couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag, and they're all talking about more murder and more war. Look at that little clown, Trump. You know, this guy went to military school. When I was a young guy, I'm the same age. When I was a young guy, that was the greatest threat your parents could give to you when you were over the, over the edge. You little... <laughs> I'm going to send you to military school. Trump was so out of his mind, they sent him to military school. Not far from us over here in Cornwall, New York. A little place where it was spoiled rich boys. <laughs> he didn't fight. He didn't go in the war. I'm going to build the biggest military and nobody's going to mess with us. Screw you. Save your jive for someone else. So they're going to take us to war. And you're going to see it near the end of the elections. Because you go back and that's the scenario. Go back to Woodrow Wilson. I promise we won't get involved in that World War One until you reelect me. Go back to FDR. No, 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 not that war until you reelect me. Go back to Richard Nixon. I got a plan to get us out of Vietnam. Yeah, I'm going to bomb Cambodia and Laos, and we're going to kill another couple of million people. Oh, I forgot Johnson before him. Yeah, and, and I, I imagine Mr. Trump might even think war is good for the economy. He hasn't given too many things about the economy much thought. On on the topic of uh, of gold, it's really breaking out here in 2016, Mr. Salente. The mining shares have literally doubled. Um, I, know in, I know this is covered in the Trends Journal. Uh, and by the way, for anyone listening to this, go search the Trends Journal or go to the Trends Journal uh, you can see all kinds of videos of Mr. Salente, but most importantly, subscribe and get the Trends Journal. It's something that can be very rewarding and fulfilling for your life, being able to evaluate uh, the economy and the world honestly. And like he said, he, he, he's not picking sides. He's just reporting the facts and uh, how the trends are likely to play out. Uh, Mr. Salente on gold. What does it look like for 2016? Does it look like the the uh, the downtrend is essentially over and possibly the uptrend is here? Yes. Uh, we've been forecasting this for quite some time. When gold started to unravel, uh, we said at the bottom, right from the very beginning, when, when gold started going from the 1900s, by the time it hit about 1600, we said 
you know, there's a ways down for this thing to go, and we sit around 1,150 is the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it got a little lower than that. We think we think it hit, has hit its bottom. And again, we don't give financial advice. We're trend forecasters. We've been saying now, and we're on record. By the way, besides the Trends Journal, we do weekly broadcasts each night, each weekday night, of trends in the news, 15-minute current events and, and how they're forming future trends. And we have a trend alert we put out each week, and we also have a trends monthly. So anyway, we've been saying now for the better part of, of two years that gold has to solidify very strongly over 1200 from 1200 it moves to 1400 after it solidifies over 1400 we believe the spike is to it back into the highs to near 2000 or above but we believe it's going to spike when it goes over 1400 do you um do you guys cover i know again you, you, this is not an investment advisor this is a trends journal uh, trends uh, analyzing and forecasting company, but uh, with the base metal miners uh, basically shutting down mines, large copper mines shutting down, large zinc mines shutting down, uh, and about two thirds of the silver comes from these mines. And I noticed that silver, unlike many other uh, of the base metals and other commodities, the demand is rising while supply is contracting. Do you guys cover silver at all and have any thoughts on silver? Yes, I, I've been covering silver. By the way, I bought my first gold um, at uh, one hundred eighty-seven dollars and fifty cents, one hundred eighty-seven fifty an ounce, back in the late seventies. And I parlayed a five thousand dollar bet up to almost three quarters of a million, and that's how I began in the business. But to, to make a long story short, I ended up losing most of it. I ended up with I, I won about uh, about. 150,000 after it was all said and done. But I was a young guy, didn't know what I was doing. And going back into the late 70s, nobody was doing this stuff. It was brand new. You know, you, it was, you, you had trouble finding people on how, to, on how to play the markets. But anyway, I always, I always knew more about gold and silver because as you also mentioned, that the minings, that the mines that are being shut down Silver does mirror gold to a very large extent, and I believe it's going to continue to. But silver also has industrial production value. Less so with gold. Gold, gold is more ornamental and jewelry driven. And so to me, silver is, is, is a great play. But just personally speaking, I know more about gold. And I also like more about gold because if the worst happens, and you know the motto is, is one of our mottos is prepare for the worst. If the worst happens and you're not prepared, you can lose everything. If you're prepared for the worst and the worst does not happen, you've lost nothing. So, for example, in preparing for the worst with gold, you know, suppose you have to exit stage right. You know, things are really bad. You've got to get out of here. Enough about it. And to me, gold is more attractive. Mr. Salente, for income or business opportunities, uh, if you are an entrepreneur starting out today or somebody who possibly was just recently laid off, do you service the millennials or do you service the baby boomers? Because I know the generations are about the same size. You service both of them, but what you really have to service, and, and again, this is not being elitist, you have to service the people with money. And that's where you're going to make your money in the sectors. You don't go into sectors where there's thin margin, profit margins. And the millennials are mostly, you know, a lot of them are busted. What do you have, you know, look how many are living home with mommy and daddy at record numbers because they can't afford their own homes. They can't even afford an apartment. So, you, you have to go to where the money is, and the money to us is in food, clean food, clean water. In talking about the baby boom generation, the leading edge is turning 70 years old this year. I and mean, this is the, you know, this is the Howdy Doody, David Crockett, Mickey Mouse Club group. Now they're going to be, you know, they're going to be inmates in nursing homes, a lot of them. 
So anything having to do with artful aging, exercise, anything having to do with savings, self-protection, anything having to do with the aging baby boomers is going to find a big market. On the millennial end, you know, they're, they're, they're just an up-and-coming generation, and they're really short-changed. And I'm saying that because they have very few reference points. For example, the baby boom generation grew up at the height of American prosperity. You have a different reference point. In going back, you were there. You were there before there were Walmarts and dollar stores. You were there be before home goods and uh, I mean, rather uh, Home Depot and Lowe's cornered the, the markets and the, and the neighborhoods used to have hardware stores. And where there were more than just Staples and Office Depot and these type of stationary stores. And before Macy's and Target's took over, there used to be, you know, mom and pop shops. So the 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 the, the uh, millennials are very short changed in terms of if you haven't been there you don't know what it feels like you can't you can't imagine what it would be for example to to ride a horse and buggy every day unless you did it it's a lot different than driving a car so the millennials are almost the lost generation at this point having said that there's a segment of them that are looking back to the past to recreate it for a new future, you know, redesigning it for 21st century. And that's the cutting edge of that generation. And so that's what you do in each of the market segments, is you go for the cutting edge of the generations that have the wherewithal, financially, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, to seize the opportunities. Yeah, it's it's changed so much, especially during the millennials' uh, lifetime. You'll you'll get a real kick out of this. My four year old was with me in the grocery store uh, the other day, and uh, she pointed to a newspaper, and she said, "Daddy, what's that?" <laughs> and uh, wow. I, I I explained it to her because, of course, I'm you know I'm I'm in my mid thirties, and you know we use I use computers and uh, you know iPads and iPhones, so uh, you know she just didn't understand it. I was like, oh, it's well, it's where you used to get your news uh, prior to the computer. Well, Gerald, I want to leave us off with one last question. In your recent Trends Journal, uh, there's a scary forecast. The panic of 2016 will be worse than the 2008 panic. And when I look at 2008, millions of foreclosures, millions of layoffs, asset deflation that took the housing market down 50% and the stock market down, what how how what what will the 2016 panic look like if it's going to be even worse? What are what are some significant things that you see playing out? Well, let's look at the you, the wealth that has been created. And again, I'm not making these numbers; these numbers are factual. According to Oxfam, for instance, 62 people in the world have more money than half the world's population combined. Since they began quantitative easing and zero interest rate policy in the United States back in 2009, 95% of the wealth went to 1%. 51% of the people in the United States that are employed are earning under $30,000 a year. Less than half the population can, are considered families are considered middle class now in America, and the gap between the rich and the poor is as bad as it was at the worst times during the Gilded Age, going back over 100 years ago. So, what happens when the panic of 2016 happens? The panic of 08 helped wipe out the middle class. This is going to help eliminate it to a large degree, because they're deep in debt, particularly you know, the millennial generation with their college loans are over a trillion dollars. People are getting out of school, beginning their lives with, and having 50, 60, 80, 100,000 dollars in debt. This is unheard of. Another reason why they can't buy homes or live alone. Now, what this is going to do, it's going to knock out the top. 
and the top survive the other crash because the top are the ones that are totally leveraged out because there's no more savings anymore. It's only markets because of zero interest rate policy. So the markets have been artificially juiced up because of a cheap dough and all the stock buybacks and mergers and acquisition activity that hit a record in 2015. So when this thing comes down, it takes the top down. The last time it pulled out the bottom. So this is going to be a top-down crash. And there's not going to be anything to pump it back up because they've blown all their ammunition. And the ammunition, of course, is quantitative easing. And now, of course, it's zero, a negative interest rate policy. But you can see it didn't work in Japan, and it's not going to work anywhere. So there is no more ammunition. Will they try other things? Yes. Could it boost the market again? Yes. I can tell you in New York, the 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 action in, in, in the real estate market is really really slowed down. Yeah, I, I can tell you. I'm in I'm in uh, Central Texas, and um, it's definitely. I mean, this thing was booming, screaming. And it's, it's definitely topping off here. Well, hey, Mr. Salente, thank you so much for your time. Everyone who's listening to this, you go to trendsresearch.com. Trendsresearch.com. As Mr. Salente said, there's interviews. Uh, you become a subscriber. There, there is not only the Trends Journal, but weekly updates, an uh, evening update. Uh, definitely something that everyone should have, especially right now. You just heard Mr. Salente point out all the things that are going on in 2016 in the economy.